Okay, good morning, everyone. Good We're almost at the 4th of July. How about that, huh? Yay. <laughs> Yay. Yay. All right, well, everybody pull out your Bibles, and let's get to Colossians 4. And guess what today is? Me. It's the end. That's right. We are concluding with our uh, study of Colossians. Anybody sad about that? Uh, yes. It's been good. It's been good. good. It has been good. It's okay. Good. All right. That's good to hear. That's good to hear. Yeah, so it's our last passage, uh, our last message, I should say, and the last passage in Colossians for our study this time. Now, you remember that last week, some of you remember because you were here, that um, we began this um, verse 7, so it's Colossians 4, starting at verse 7, through verse 18, we have this list of names, and really they're, they're Paul's friends, but I like to look at this as a photo. It's as if, um, you know, Paul writes this letter, and then at the very end, he signs it, right? Verse 18, he says, I write this greeting in my own hand, so he signs the letter, but then he sticks a picture in there. And that's really what verses 17, I'm sorry, 7 through 17 are. They're a picture of his friends. Some of his co-workers in, in the gospel is uh, people that are uh, in ministry with him. And so we are, you know, this, these are the verses that most people skip. They see the names and it says, oh, his concluding remarks, so I don't need to bother with that. And so hardly anybody ever reads these verses. But remember what I told you last week? All Scripture is God-breathed, and it's useful for our discipleship. So it's absolutely something we should read. It's something maybe reading won't help, but studying sure will. And so my task has been, let's pull out these specific names. There's ten names that Paul lists in these verses. And in each one of these names, so this is more biographical than is theological, but isn't it true, Scripture guys, that when we look at, like say, the Old Testament, and you see some of the people in the Old Testament, and you watch their story unfold. And there's moments where you go, ooh, that was bad. I've done that, though. Or, ooh, that was good. I should do that more. And so you're learning from the lives of people that, well, we hope walk with God. Um, that's really what the New Testament offers us as well. And so when we see these, these names that pop up, these guys, these people have a story. We just need to discover what it is. And through that, we learn from them. We learn from our brothers and sisters. Last week, we did the first four. So can I just quickly review those and we'll just keep going today? All right, if you're, you have your notes from last time or you got to start over? You have your notes. Wow, one person, two people. Wow, three people. This is incredible. Three out of whatever. Okay, well, if you didn't bring your list from last time, just start over. It's okay. Uh, Tychicus, that was the first name on the list. And with each of these people, I have a kind of a comma and a description. And for Tychicus, we put, he's a loyal and trustworthy friend. So this guy was trustworthy. He, look, whatever had to be done, whether it was behind the scenes or up front, he would do whatever it took. He was somebody that Paul trusted to, you know, take money from uh, this place over to Rome, or if it was to, you know, fill in for a couple of pastors, that's no small task, or even deliver three of what would eventually be canonized books of the Bible from this jail back to Colossae and to Ephesus, and of course the letter to Philemon. So Tychicus, we can learn from. The church needs more Tychicuses. Those people who are willing to serve, no matter where it is, no matter where you're called, even if it's not so prominent. And the next guy on the list, in the picture, remember, go over to the right there, oh, there's Onesimus. And Onesimus was a man with a past. He had a, a checkered past. He was a slave who uh, left, which is illegal. He's a fugitive. He stole on his way out. And he stole from Philemon. But then God got a hold of him, he got saved, he went back to Philemon, reconciled, and eventually, what happened on Esmas? You remember? Became a, Became a pastor. How about that? So how, what do we learn from him? Well, first of all, we all have a past. We all fall short of the glory of God. But isn't it cool that God doesn't leave us there? That, especially for his children, he scoops us up, cleans us up, and does things with our lives we can couldn't hardly ever imagine. Right? That's Onesimus. Next guy in the picture, um, Aristarchus. 
Aristarchus was a burden barrier. I'm uh, sorry, burden bearer. Sorry, that's interesting. Burden barrier. <laughs> that's the opposite. No, a burden bearer. Aristarchus was a man that was with Paul during some of the most intensely horrible times of his life. Some of the most challenging, difficult moments. This man was right there with Paul and wouldn't desert him. And I said this last time, what we don't need, we don't need fair weather fans. I mean fair weather friends. We need friends with us in the good and the bad and the ugly. That's what we all need. And thank God I think we have a bunch of them that we're looking at right here. Uh, and then the last guy we saw last week was Mark. You remember Mark, let's call him from useless to useful. Mark, after he was saved, deserted Paul, deserted the ministry that Paul knew that Mark had from God uh, for whatever reason. We don't know why. Um, and Paul called him useless. But then God got a hold of him. Now remember, he's, he's in Christ, guys. So what's the lesson there? Even when we're saved, do we mess up? Guys, are there moments in our ministries and our lives that you say, man, I, I regret that. I wish I'd have said that. I wish I'd have done that. I wish I didn't do that. That's Mark. You know the man had moments in his life where he just went, ah, that was a mistake. And yet, what did God do? Did he leave him there? Remember Jesus' promises to finish the work he began? That's exactly what he did with Mark. And I think he used the Apostle Peter, who was also a deserter, who better to disciple Mark than Peter? And this man came to his senses, and Paul, at the end of his life, said, this man, Mark, is useful to me. He's useful in ministry. That's our hope. God is a God of first, second, third, fourth, fiftieth, a hundredth chances. So those are the first, the first four guys, uh, first four people. Now we got six more. Some of these I'm going to camp on a little longer than others, but give me some time here, gang, and we're going to get through the list. Okay? I want this to be our last Sunday. And I hope everybody's awake. If not, we got coffee. And Presley will kick you under the table. It'll be fine. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Let's bow in prayer. Let's ask God to teach us today. So Jesus, this is your word, and Holy Spirit, you inspired it, you, uh, you wrote it, and um, we just love you, and we thank you, and we want to hear from you. We're your sheep, we're your people. Your word clearly tells us that your sheep hear the shepherd's voice, your, your voice. And so God, we are not just wanting to hear, we're desperate to hear your voice. We need to hear the words of God. Uh, the pages of this book, Lord, they're literally, it's as if you poured yourself out on this these, these, these pages and the black and white ink comes alive when we study it. Holy Spirit, we pray. This is your pulpit. You take it. Take the verses. Take the notes. And just put us there, God. Put us right there. Let us meet these people as if they're right in front of us and we're shaking their hands. God, help us to learn from these people. Not just the good stuff, but the bad stuff. And not just the bad stuff, but the good stuff. And Lord, we want to be, today, we want to be better for you than we were yesterday. Today, Lord, we want to be, all the things that we did this past week, God, we want to see it correctly. If there's forgiveness that's required, we ask for it. If there's hope because of it, Lord, we cherish it. We just pray, Lord, speak to us today. And we ask this in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. The next person on the list, we're just going to call him Justice. And he spelled it wrong. J-U-S-T-U-S. -S. It's not just this. It's just us. Nobody finds that funny, just us? Okay. <laughs> it's just us. Yeah, anyway, okay. Look at verse 11. So back up actually with me to verse 10. What does it say? It says, Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, he sends his greetings, right? He says hi. Also Barnabas' cousin Mark, he says hi. Oh, and by the way, he says you need to receive him. Okay, remember, Mark had a, rep a reputation and... Churches didn't want to receive a deserter, but he said, no, no, he's cool. It's all good. But he says hi. And then he says in verse 11, oh, and by the way, Justice says hi. Justice, he says, but what's the name he says first? Jesus, who is called Justice. All right. Let me just say right off the bat, don't know much about this guy at all. 
But from his name and also from what Paul says in the rest of verse 11, which I'll read in a minute, we actually can glean quite a bit from, from those things. So let's deal with his name first. Uh, if you were named Jesus, and then, well, Jesus, Yeshua, that means Savior. We know a guy named Jesus, right? Don't we know somebody named Jesus? We worship a man named Jesus, right? Yeah. Um, but then you have Justice, and that's his Greek name. That means the righteous. So this man's name is Jesus the Righteous. I would say that's a kind of a tough name to live up to. Wouldn't you say? You're introducing somebody. Hey, this is Dean. Yeah, Dean's a cool guy. There's Rick. And, uh, and this is Jesus <laughs> the Righteous. Well... So, it's actually a very common name, Hebrew name, Jesus. It really was a very common name. And it was common also for Jew, uh, Jewish people, and that's, uh, Justice was Jewish, to have a name, a Roman name, we'll call it. And that was Justice. <coughs> but I think this man, I don't know him, and he doesn't say much about him in the scriptures, but um, Paul says something very interesting. First of all, he does come up, uh, Justice does, in Acts chapter 28. Let me tell you about that situation real quickly. Acts 28 and verse 17, uh, Paul, this is the last book of Acts 20, uh, of the book of Acts, Acts 28. This is where Paul finally gets to Rome. You know, it's, it's, there's a shipwreck and it's just been an ordeal. But he gets there and the first thing he does, he says, okay, I want to call all of the Jewish religious leaders of Rome together. I got to talk with them. So that happens. All the Jewish leaders in Rome come and see Paul. Paul then shares, no doubt, shares his, what Christianity is all about, right? He starts to share his journey, how I got here, probably telling him, hey, fellas, um, I'm not here, I'm not going to jail because I did anything wrong. I went, I'm going to jail because here's what happened to me. And it says in that verse that um, these men these Roman Jews said, well, can you tell us about this Christianity thing a little bit more? They call it a sect, S-E-C-T. Can you tell us more about this sect called the Way? And so what does Paul do? Well, he shares his testimony and he shares the gospel. Some of those men got saved, while others didn't. Remember, these are Roman Jewish leaders. One of those men who got saved was probably Justice. So here's what we can infer. Jesus called Justice was a Roman Jew who believed in Jesus. And that was an encouragement or a comfort to Paul. So we can call Justice a comfort to Paul. He says in these verses, Aristarchus, Mark, and Jesus called justice. He says, verse 11, these are the only fellow workers from the kingdom of God who are from the circumcision also. These are believers who are from the circumcision, simply he's talking about their Jews. And then he says, and they have proven to be a comfort to me. Okay. Can you, can you imagine if you're Paul, you're a Jew, you're a Jew of Jews, um, you're the apostle sent out into the Gentile, non-Jewish world, so you're, you're the apostle to the Gentiles. What does Paul do in every town he goes to? Well, the first thing he does, he says, show me the synagogue, because I'm sharing the gospel there first. He says in Romans 1.16 that the gospel is the power of God for salvation for those who believe, comma, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. In other words, Paul has an incredibly deep love not only for his brothers and sisters in Christ, but his brothers and sisters of Israel. God is going to make good on the promise that he made in Genesis chapter 12. And so, he says, these three men are a comfort to me because they're my Jewish brethren who also love Jesus. That was a huge comfort. By the way, the word encouragement or comfort, it, it's a medical term that means comfort that relieves pain. 
Justice would be a great ad for Tylenol. Because he relieved this man's pain. He relieved Paul's pain. Uh, uh, just a little reminder, where's Paul writing Colossians from? From prison. You think it was tough to be in prison? Especially in a Roman prison? You bet it was. And so Paul is absolutely suffering. He's not a superhero. Yes, things are getting done. Yes, he praises God. And yes, he writes about joy. And he says, hey, man, the, the kingdom's being expanded here. But that doesn't take away the fact that he's in jail. And it's really hard. And so he says, these three guys, they are like pain reliever for me. And what can we glean from Jesus called justice? I read one commentator, he said, some believers are a pain in the neck, while others relieve your pain. And I thought, man, what a great statement. Because there are, there are some people in the church that they don't bring you any relief. In fact, they bring you anything but relief. But then there's certain you know, brothers and sisters in the body that just being around them, just being who they are, they bring you relief from the pain of being in this world. If you can define what a church is practically for God's people, wouldn't it be that? I mean, a place to learn, a place to grow, grow a place to be disciples and make disciples, absolutely. But isn't it true that we need to be a family that brings comfort amidst the pain of this world? And I'm not sure that a lot of churches get that. Because church is some place you attend and leave rather than some place that you are and you gather together in the name of Jesus. Amen? So that's what we learned from Jesus called justice. Okay. Oh, and by the way, I did write down here, make sure to tell them Lisa and I find you a comfort. We, you bring us comfort. You bring us comfort. Even Abby. You bring us comfort, Abby. <laughs> Next guy in the picture is Epaphras. E-P-A-P-H-R-A-S. Epaphras. Now I'm going to talk more about Epaphras today than any of these people because, well, these ten people on the list and in the photo... If you're going to take away anything from any of them, I'd say the top of the list. Please listen to what Epaphras is all about. Let's, let's learn from this man. Look at verse 12. Epaphras, who was one of your number, Colossians, a bond slave of Jesus Christ, he says hi also. Okay, In this, look at verse 12. The middle of it says, Epaphras, always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. Now, if you highlight in your Bible, I would highlight that. Always laboring earnestly for you in his prayers. That you may stand perfect, that's mature, and fully assured in all the will of God. For I testify on his behalf that he has a deep concern for you, talking to the local church in Colossae, and also for those who are in Laodicea and Hierapolis. Okay, we haven't talked about Epaphras in a while. We've talked about him at the beginning of the letter a lot because Epaphras was the planter of the church at Colossae. He's the church planter. Real briefly, I'll tell you about him, his story. Epaphras from Colossae. Uh, okay, everybody, I don't have a, any kind of visual aid here, so bear with me. All right, so here is Colossae. Here is uh, Hierapolis, and here is Laodicea. So that should look familiar to you. Here's Greeley, here's Fort Collins, here's Loveland. It's very similar to that geography. We have a city about an hour south called Denver, right? <laughs> they had a city about an hour west called Ephesus. And Ephesus was massive. It was the Denver of the area. Ephesus was a religious center. It was, a, it was right on the edge there in the water, so it was a, a port city. Epaphras, for whatever reason, goes to Ephesus. He gets saved there, probably under the teaching of Paul. He gets saved, and what does he do? He goes back home, and he starts a church. So Epaphras was the planter of the church in Colossae. 
Now, <clears throat> that's great, but I think in this passage we get a little glimpse of this man's heart. Because he was more than just a man who planted a church. He says, first of all, Paul calls him a bond slave of Christ. Now please remember that in these times, even to call yourself a Christian out loud was putting your life on the line. When a person gave their lives to Jesus, whether Greek or Jew, didn't matter. Whenever they did that, they would, the possibility of them losing significant things was very high. For instance, a lot of them, a lot of Christians lost their livelihoods. They lost their jobs. A lot of Christians lost their friends. A lot of Christians lost their families. Their families would outright abandon them. Lots of these Christians lost their health because they were beaten and abused. And lots of Christians lost their lives. So for him to say, no, this is a bondservant of, of Christ, that's to say, oh, he knows Jesus, and he's a prisoner of Christ. Where, whatever it takes, he's going to share the gospel, and even if that means he loses his life. And if you're a slave of somebody, everything about you is owned by that slave master, right? So that's what slave, bond slave of Christ means. Everything about you is owned by the master, the capital M, master. But then also, Paul says, this man, he says, listen up, Colossians, your brother Epaphras is constantly laboring for you in prayer. Now here's what that means. I, I don't know if I'll be able to express the, the gravity of these words, but I'm going to try. This word for laboring, agonizomahi, it's where we get our English word for agonize. That word means to struggle, to strive, to fight. By the way, Epaphras, I'm calling him a prayer warrior. Okay, he's a prayer warrior. To fight, and it's not just to fight, but it's to fight to win. In other words, you can fight, like you can get in the ring with somebody, and they can punch you a few times in the face, and you can go, oh, I didn't sign up for this, I'm out. No, this is like Rocky. He gets punched in the face 20,000 times and still comes back for more. That's what that word is talking about. Fighting, agonizing, to win. Never to give up. Laboring earnestly. This, this earnestly, it means fervently, passionately, intensely. What Paul is saying is that, you, look, local church that Epaphras is a part of, you need to know that this man is fighting for you from his knees. He knows what your enemy is doing. See, what Epaphras did is, after the church was planted, you know, when he came back to Colossae, about 10 years, give or take, later, um, Paul's in jail, and Epaphras goes to Rome to talk to him about the heresies that are coming to Colossae and to Hierapolis and to Laodicea. Massive heresies about Jesus, denying his deity, denying he's a human, a man, denying these things about Jesus that are true, and there are all these lies, and it's affecting believers, it's affecting Christians badly. And so Epaphras says, I've got to go tell Paul about this. And Paul writes this letter to the Colossians as a, res a response to that. And that's why a lot of the letter is about Jesus. It's about the preeminence of Christ. And so Paul is saying, look, Paul, um, Epaphras told me about what's going on. He's told me about all the heresies. You've got to know something. That he's fighting for you on his knees. From his knees. Uh, he, look, he knows what your enemy's doing. He knows how your enemy's trying to lie to you and deceive you all the time. He knows the danger that these her uh, heresies are bringing to your church. He knows it has a danger of ripping you apart and ripping your heart away from God. Hey, guys, let me push pause for a second. I want you to understand something. If you believe a lie, even one lie about God, your whole faith walk is in danger of crumbling. If you believe even one wrong thing, one lie about God, your whole walk with Christ can fall apart. Why do you think people abandon their faith in Christ? 
because they believe something untrue about God. And so you see, Epaphras is going, I know that can happen, so what does he do about it? Well, he fights for them from his knees. And he says, not just you guys, not just the local church there. He says, I, he's praying for the region. <laughs> he's praying for the churches in Hierapolis and Laodicea. That's his heart, to pray for all believers in his area. Laboring earnestly. You know, look, there's a lot of things that we can glean from this. I think some of them are obvious, but let me ask you a question. So, when I ask you about somebody in your life that doesn't know the Lord, that you love very much, maybe somebody in your family, or a close friend, longtime friend, and they've They've just, they've maybe come close to the Lord, you know, kind of warm themselves up next to the fire of the Spirit, you know, but then they walked away and they keep making choices that are just really bad and foolish. And for a little while there, you hung in there in prayer. You know, you prayed for them, but then they did something that was just like, really? You do that? And not only did that choice hurt them, but it hurt others around them very profoundly. Okay, can I ask you, did you stop praying for them earnestly? At what point do we say, okay, this is this, the point where I stop praying for them and, and, and fight for them on my knees? When is it that I stop fighting for them? See, for Epaphras, that moment, that wall never was there. So the more people sinned, the more people struggled, guess what he did? His prayer life didn't get less. It got more, and it got more intense. I think there's something for us to learn there. That the more people do stuff that's really dumb and really ungodly, instead of complaining at them or about them in our hearts and minds, I think we need to go even more deeper in prayer for them. Do you, do you agree? How many people are we fighting for on our or from our knees? Uh, George Mueller, you ever heard that name? George Mueller? He, uh, he was uh, in, from England, um, he, director of the uh, Ashley Down Orphanage in Bristol, England. I mean, this man was, many miracles <laughs> happened at this orphanage. But he writes um, that, he, he, or he, somebody wrote about him and said that November 1844, he began to pray for five specific individuals. And it says, um, so we prayed for different things, and uh, 18 months elapsed, the first one was converted. And he thanked God. Five years later, the second one was converted. He thanked God, continued to pray. Six years passed, the third was converted. Um, and he thanked God for all three, and he kept praying for the other two until he died. After he died, guess what happened? The other two came to Christ. And this man prayed for them for 52 years. I'm sorry, 52 years later. 52 years later, they came to Christ. So he was dead for a while there. But think about that. All his life, he prayed, didn't give up, prayed earnestly. And 52 years later, after he started praying for them, the last two came to Christ. I want to pray like that. I want to pray like that. And I want to pray in a way that when I'm praying and they do something that's hurtful to me or hurtful to others or hurtful to themselves, it doesn't make me stop praying. It makes me pray more. That's what I want to learn from Epaphras. I also want to learn this. Um, for somebody to fight like that from their knees, they must really believe that God is powerful enough to help them. They must really believe that God is the only solution to all of their problems. They must believe with all their hearts that He has the power to convert them, to change them, to help them. They must really, really believe that God, He's the solution. And sometimes, I don't know if we in America really understand that. 
So that's what I think we could learn from Epaphras, the prayer warrior. And not just praying for our body, but praying for believers in our region, believers in our circle of influence, uh, people that aren't in Christ, but we're going to pray for them. We're going to pray that they come to Christ, like George Mueller. Pray for the man for his whole life, and then 52 years later, after he started, they came to Christ after he was dead. Okay. Next guy in the picture is Luke. Luke was the beloved doctor. Uh, Paul says, verse 14, Luke, the beloved physician, says hi. There you go. Hey, Luke says hi. 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 <laughs> okay, Luke was a doctor. He wasn't just a doctor, though. Apparently, he was a really good one. He was very skilled. Um, and in this culture, the Greek culture, doctors were held in very high regard because you had to be really pretty smart to be one. Obviously, the Apostle Paul knew it was good to have a doctor as well. Think about it. Paul, when God told him to, would heal people. Yes? And yet, Paul still needed a physician. So he, he could heal when God told him to, but he knew the benefits of having an actual doctor on hand. Luke was there with him, traveled with him. Um, Luke was more than just a doctor to Paul, though. He was a trusted friend. In fact, in the last letter that Paul wrote was 2 Timothy, and he's in this Roman dungeon waiting to die, and he said, only Luke is with me. So to the very bitter end, who was with him? Luke. Um, I was thinking about this, how, you know, if you're a doctor and your only patient was Paul, that probably wouldn't be too lucrative a business, you know? Um, if you open up your own practice, you make a lot more money. But I don't think Luke was, um, he, he didn't care about that. I think Luke's priorities were right in line with God's, which was he was supposed to be with Paul to the bitter end, and he was. And here's the thing about Luke. Luke was a non-Jew. He was a Gentile. And God chose him to write two of the books of the New Testament, the Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. He's one of the only Gentile authors of the Bible. Isn't that cool? What do we learn from him? Well, I think we learn that, so God gives us our talents, He gives us our gifts. Um, whenever we can, we want to give those back to Him and say, God, you've done this, you've built me this way, but I don't care about money. What I care about is your kingdom, and I want to give these gifts back and present them to you. And then look how He used Luke. Next guy in the photo, there's three more. Demas, verse 14, Demas, it says, Demas also says hi, right? Luke says hi and also Demas. All right, who's Demas? Demas is, we're going to call him the defector. So this is the tragedy of the list. Now listen to me carefully. When Colossians was written, Demas claimed to be a Christian. And not just claimed to be, but uh, in Philemon, verse 2, Paul calls him a fellow worker. So Demas didn't only claim to be a Christian, Demas was involved in ministry. The last letter that Paul wrote, again, 2 Timothy, somewhere something happened to Demas, because this is what Paul says about him. He's writing to Timothy, and he says, Timothy, make every effort to come to me, because Demas has deserted me. Wow. Really, Paul? Yep. Why did he do that? Because he loved the things of this world. And he went back to Thessalonica. Okay. Here's a person who was following Jesus for a little while and even laboring for the gospel and the kingdom until the cares of the world, the enticements, the God's not doing what I want him to do, you know, whatever. The world stole his heart away from Jesus. And I was thinking about this as I was studying Demas a little bit. You know, guys, I, I really can't count. I don't know how many people. I baptized them. I, I was their pastor. I was there for them, watched them grow, taught them from the Word. 
And then something happened. And they said, you know what? Uh, this God thing, this Jesus thing, I'm done. And they just walked away. I don't know exactly what happened, but I know it was something probably that Scripture talks about. Remember when Jesus talked about the soils, the parable of soils, and there's a, you know, a soil that it receives the word, it receives the truth, the excitement, and then all of a sudden the cares of the world come along and we're done. That was Demas. And let me just say this. Look, Scripture gives us these proofs that we're really in Christ. Um, love for our brothers. Love for the Word. Hunger for the Word. Um, you know, there's, there's probably a, a host of them. Things that, you know, fruits that you can say, okay, I think this man or this woman loves the Lord. But I think the top of that list of proofs of faith, genuine faith, fruits of the Spirit. Remember, Jesus said, if you abide in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. You can't help but have the life of God in you not come out. So, the fruit of the Spirit. But here's the other one. Perseverance of faith. How many times does the Scripture say, if you remain in your faith, if you remain in your faith, if you remain in your faith? I think because so many abandon their faith. And for a while, they, they go through the drudgery, you know, the, the, the ups and downs of ministry, and then somewhere they go, I'm done. Every true child of God is going to not only bear the fruit of God's life, but they're going to endure through all the good, the bad, the ugly that this world and this, the, our enemy has to throw at us. And Demas wasn't one of those. Next, Nympha. Um, this one was hard to, to encapsulate, so I just said the Laodicean host. Okay, so... There's not much about this person. Um, verse 15 says, Greet the brethren who are in Laodicea, and also Nympha, and the church that is in her house. And when this letter is read among you, have it also read the church of Laodicea. And read my letter that's coming from Laodicea. So, um, this person, and some, there is a little debate as, about, about, as far as if it's a man or a woman. Some translations would do it Nymphus the masculine form of this, this name. But most would agree that this is a woman. Her name is Nympha. She lived in Laodicea, and the church met in her house. That's it. That's all we know about her. <laughs> okay? I would say that if you're going to have a, a church in your home, you have to be generous. And you probably have to be a follower of Christ, you would think. That would help. Right? So... Um, we don't know much about this person. We just know that they were generous enough to open up their home to the local church there. And then finally, last one in the picture, Archippus. Archippus. We're going to call him Philemon's son. This is Philemon's son. Paul says, verse 17, Say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry of which you received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. Okay, Archippus is mentioned in Philemon, verse 2. It lists them among the family. It was Philemon, your wife, and then your, your son um, is what we can glean. That's probably Archippus is his son. Archippus, of course, he's in the church there in Colossae. And for some reason, for whatever reason, we don't know why, Archippus... Um, he has to be prompted by Paul, hey, young man, finish the ministry, fulfill the ministry, complete it that God gave you. Now, he is called our fellow soldier in Philemon verse 2. So this is a guy who's an active Christian. But, encouragement, admonishment, whatever, Paul has to say, you need to fulfill the ministry God gave you. Now, I take that to read this. Many times, ministry requires us to, think, to do things that aren't easy and aren't so glamorous. In fact, I would say 99% of ministry is not easy and not glamorous. But whatever we're called to do, we need to do it. Um, there is no ministry too small. 
And look, I get it. I know this generation today, I, I hear it all the time. Man, I want to do big things for the Lord. I want my, my ministry to count. And when I fear sometimes when that kind of stuff is spoken, it's, more, it's really the words are, I really want to be, I want my ministry to be glorious. I don't want everybody to know about it. What about those people that um, aren't in front of people at all, but they're fighting for people from their knees, and nobody knows about it? How about those people? Do you think their ministry is important? I think we learn from Epaphras, it's absolutely vital. But nobody knows, unless they pray in front of them, and then, you know, that's a different problem. What about the, the people who clean the toilets? Change the diapers? How, how about how many how many of you just in this past week were involved with something whether it was prayer something or a, you know your a conversation with somebody that nobody knew about but that you walked away from that and you went that was a God moment look guys whatever the ministry is that we've, we've been given let's do it and I think sometimes we get into this thinking where you say well I don't know what God wants me to do well here's here's the answer to that what has He called you to do today? Because a lot of times God doesn't give you a five-year ministry plan. He gives you a five-minute ministry plan. How about let's accomplish the task He put in front of you right there and now? How about that? Let's not gauge whether or not our ministry is valid on whether or not it's exciting. Because most ministry is not. And by the way, as a church body, we're a team. So sometimes you won't know what your ministry is until you're active with the body, until you're just relating with the church. Okay. We got finished with the list. Yay. Yeah. I want to close with a couple of things real quick, though. So I told you that, or the text says that, Epaphras was praying, laboring earnestly in prayer. I just want you to see what he was laboring for. And I, I want this to be our, our prayer for one another. <clears throat> so his, his passionate, intense praying was for two things. One of those things was he wants us to be mature. Uh, he wants the Colossians to be mature. Um, perfect. That means that whatever the heresies were coming at them, whatever the lies that they lived with and swirling around them, he wanted them to be secure in their faith and stand firm. Beloved, are we praying for one another? Help my brothers and my sisters to stand firm amongst the lies. And the other thing he says, he says, I'm praying, uh, he's praying, Papas is praying, that you be fully assured in the full fullness of the will of God. Are we praying for one another that though the lies come and they are attacking us, are we standing fast in what is true, the will of God? That's the prayer. And you know, I, I, I love how we have this list of names and we have all of these different people, personalities, you know, all of these different, <laughs> these different uh, good, bad, ugly, all that. And yet, the one constant is God. I love that. We humans bring a variety of issues to the table. What does God bring? Fortress, rock, never changes. And I'm so grateful that even a list of names, we're going to still find the glory of God and the goodness of God. Amen? So I would like to pray. Of course, we're going to get in our small groups here, and I want you to talk about... Um, you know, which one of these people stood out the most. But can I just ask you please to bow your heads, put your notes aside for a second, and maybe let's take about a minute. Just let's pray for this body right now. Let's pray for Commission Church. That we would stand firm against the lies, standing firm in the fullness of the will of God. Let's pray for one another right now, and then I'll close us.
So Lord, I pray uh, right now in closing, I just, you know, we, we see these names and I know that we kind of see ourselves on this list somewhere. Lord, I pray, help us to remember, God, no matter how we're wired, gifted, blessed, no matter what the challenges we go through, Lord, that it really is, the main thing is to see who you are. And there's moments in our lives when we can't understand why you allow certain things and we were scared of the future or we we're, the future's unknown. Or, but Lord, just help us to, to hear some of these words, to hear the priority to pray earnestly, to fight for our brothers and sisters from our knees. Help us to see that just to be available to minister wherever there's a need. Help us, God, not to be like Demas, that when the going is tough and the world gets more tempting, that we abandon you. Help us, Lord, to be generous and not fair-weather friends and all the things that we've learned about this. But God, help us to all the more see your goodness as human beings, God, we bring such a change, variety. And, but Lord, we know that you're our rock and our fortress. So God, thank you for our study in Colossians. We look forward to what you have next. In Jesus' name, amen.